All righty, welcome to week eight, our finale in the Life's Healing Choices campaign, which we started two months ago. <clears throat> two months ago, I stood before you and I presented like a vision for this campaign. And I said, our goal during this campaign is going to be that we find freedom and that we find healing, that we find recovery, that we find the ability to go past some of the things in life that maybe have been holding us back, whether it's our habits or our hangups or our hurts or our pains or things in the past that we could not have dealt with before, <clears throat> that we can get past those things. Now, most likely, here's where you are today, assuming you've been with us this past seven weeks. Here's where you are today. You are today, if you've been going along with everything we've been talking about, you've experienced some freedom, you've experienced some healing, some change, but maybe not to the degree that you had thought. Maybe you kind of had this wishful thought in your head that you would come here for seven or eight weeks, you would hear some magic words, write down some fill in the blanks, and you would be rolling for the rest of your life. Well, <clears throat> here's what I want to remind you of. In the very beginning, I said to you that this topic that we're talking about is not a flash in the pan. What we're talking about here is eight choices that you have to make and continue to make to continue to find the healing and freedom that God wants to give you. Remember our theme verse from John 8:36. If the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. That was our theme verse. If the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. But he didn't say you'll be free indeed today. So what we're going to do is what we're going to commit to doing today, especially as we look at our last choice, is take all these eight principles, these eight choices that we've been talking about, and we're going to keep on practicing them. And we're going to keep on going. And one year from today, we're going to come back. And instead of being here, we're going to be here. And instead of being here the year after that, we're going to be here. And we're going to keep on going on this, on this journey. Others of you today decided not to go along on the journey. Either maybe you're just showing up here for the first time today. You don't have any idea what I'm talking about. Or you were busy. Or you didn't really get into it. And you just kind of... Yeah, you kind of listen to the talks and kind of nice things, but you didn't really get into it. <clears throat> for you, my advice for you is, when are you going to stop? Or when are you going to start? Like how much more in pain and in slavery do you need to get before you decide that now is time to start making these life's healing choices. Here's the thing in life. Whether you're a good person or a bad person, whether you go to church, don't go to church, whether you're from Washington, D.C. or Dallas, Texas, or anywhere in between, one of the things that is inevitable about your life, I guarantee you, you will have pain. Lots of pain. It is an inevitable, universal principle of life. You will have pain. You will have hurts. You will have problems that you can't deal with, that you don't want to deal with, and you just want to keep on stuffing it further and further inside, hoping that somehow it will magically disappear. My promise to you is that you will have pain. And even being a good person, being a follower of Christ, doesn't mean you don't, won't have pain. What it does mean, if you're a follower of Christ, is not that you won't have pain, but that He will transform your pain into something positive. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Not that you won't have pain, you won't have problems, but that he will transform your pain and problems to give it meaning and substance and give purpose and reveal the purpose behind it so that you become a better person. That's why what I always say, whenever someone comes to me and talks about, they had this happen and they got this and this and this, and they're asking why. Why is the most worthless question in the world. What difference does it make if you know why? Someone close to you died. Okay, now I'll tell you why. What difference does that make? Does that make all the pain go away? You, you lost all your money. You have no money. Here, I'll tell you why. Does that make it any better? We need to stop trying to figure out why and instead try to figure out what is God trying to teach me and how is God trying to use this in my life? Here's what I believe about pain and hurt and bad experiences. God wants to do three things in your life every time he gives you pain. Three things every single time. Every pain... God wants to do these exact three same things. He wants to bless you. He wants to glorify Him. And then our topic for today, He wants to inspire others. 
You see, God is a very shrewd investor. God never wastes one hurt. God doesn't waste one painful experience in your life. And if God allows you to have a hurt, you better make no mistake about it, that God is giving it to you, and He wants to do three things with it. He wants to invest one, one and get three results from it. Bless you, bless me, glorify Him, inspire others. Our topic here for today is how to get to this point, and really the key to it is the third part, which we're going to talk about today, which we're going to talk about the sharing choice, how God wants to use the broken pieces in my life to bring healing to others. Did you ever think of that? God will use the broken pieces in my life to bring healing to other people around. God is like Tim the Toolman Taylor, or Handy Manny, or Bob Vila. No matter what's broken, he can fix it. And not only can he fix it, he can fix it and use it to make cool stuff. Maybe MacGyver is a better, a better analogy. God can use things that seem worthless and that seem painful, and he can do amazing things in your life through these things and in the life of others. Our beatitude for today is Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers. Very simple, very straightforward. God wants us to be peacemakers. <clears throat> and if you follow kind of like the, the course of salvation in the world, how God works, God wants to give peace so that you can share peace. God wants to give me peace and make peace with me so that then I can go out and give that same peace to others. <clears throat> the Bible says God wants us to be peacemakers, not just peacekeepers. And if you have experienced some peace from God, <clears throat> He's giving it to you so that you can share with others. You know why this topic is so important? What I've seen in my experience with a lot of people who struggle with pain or hurts or whatever, when are you done healing from a pain? Like, when can I say I've gotten past this issue? The answer is is when you begin to help others get out of it as well. That's when you know you're done, when you've hit recovery point. You are healed when you can begin to go out and help others to find healing as well. It's the number one proof that you have overcome the pain or the rejection or the betrayal or the hurt or the habit when you don't waste it, but then you make use of it in the life of someone else. And in addition, I can guarantee you this, the only way, the only way to make a short-term change into a long-term change is to share it with others. The only way you're going to take the short-term changes that you have been able to make and make them into long-term life character changes is you begin using it to help others. That's what engraves it inside of us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. God was in Christ reconciling himself Re I'm sorry, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us this very same word of reconciliation. You see the transaction? God reconciles and then gives us the key to the reconcile, reconciliation truck and says go out and give recon help others find reconciliation as well. That's our sharing choice for today. The eighth and final choice that we must make in order to find healing and find freedom, is I choose to yield myself to God to be used to bring the good news to others, both by my example and by my words. This is me saying, God, I'm going green. I allow you to recycle my pain. I'm going to take my pain and not just throw it away and not just keep it for myself. I'm going to put it in the recycler and you can use it to help someone else down the road. You didn't know God was green, did you? This is the choice that we need to make today. Now I can read some of your minds. I can read some of your minds. Some of you are saying, hold on. You want me to take my pain and share it with others? Man, I can't even share it with myself. I can't even deal with it myself. You want me to express it to others? and try to help others? Yeah, right. 
Some people think to themselves, I can't do that because I got a lot more to go. I got a lot more way to go in this thing. Let me tell you a little secret. And I'm telling you this, I mean, this is something I shouldn't even say. It's like a code amongst us priests that we don't tell this to others, but I'll let you in on a little secret. That I stand up here every Sunday. Do I got it all together? I appreciate you not answering quickly. The answer is no. And I don't have it all together. And I don't have it all figured out. But here's what I got. All I need to do is be one step ahead of where you are. And then I can stand up here and help you. That's it. I don't need to be perfect. All I need to do is that God has taken me from here to here so I can just go back one step and help these guys to get here. I don't have all the rest of it figured out. I wish I did. I don't. But I know the step from here to here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to this step and see someone here and help them take this step. That's it. That's all my job is. Okay? We make it seem fancy and we got, it all, we got nothing figured out. All I need to know is how to go from here to here. And if I've experienced it, I take a step back and I share it with others. To be honest, the concept of, okay, so this idea that you have in your mind that God only uses perfect people. God only uses people who have strengths and doesn't use people who have weaknesses. is completely false. God has never in the history of the world used a perfect person. Because there are no perfect people. God uses weak people all the time. And in fact, it's better that God uses weak people, right? Don't you, don't you think it's a better system that God works through weak people, not through strong people? Imagine I stand up here. Let's say we're talking about, like, prayer. Okay? So I stand up here, and I'm going to give you a lesson on prayer. And I'm going to say, I'm the best person in the world on prayer. I can pray any time of day, all the time, and I don't... Prayer is easy for me. Like, prayer is the easiest thing in the world for me, and I can do it 24 hours a day, and I cry after an hour of prayer that I have to end it. I cry. What would you think about me? You'd hate my guts. You'd hate me. You would have every right to hate me because you can't relate to that. And if I come up here and say, see how uh, I got it all figured out and, 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 and I got everything in perfect order, you'd hate my guts. But if I stand up here and say, I stink at prayer, but look how I'm trying, and this is what I learned that helped me out. Do you think you could give it a try? Which, you relate, which is more encouraging? It's very encouraging when you see someone stand up here and say, I don't have it all figured. And you think to yourself, man, even a Boone Anthony, if, he's, if he struggles with it, if, he's str if a saint like him struggles with it. We find encouragement in weaknesses of others. One of the myths is that God wants to work through your strengths. And it is false. God wants to work through your weaknesses a lot more than through your strengths. When deciding how you want to serve God, don't just look at your strengths. Look at your weaknesses. Because oftentimes it's those very same weaknesses that God wants to use. Good example for us, we're going to look today at the life of St. Paul. St. Paul was someone who had a lot of strengths, but he also had a lot of weaknesses. And what you're going to see is his weaknesses bore us a lot more encouragement and a lot more fruit and a lot more pick-me-up. His weaknesses helped me more than his strengths helped me. And we're going to see that today. Did you know there was a time in the life of St. Paul where he was weak, really weak, so weak and so down that he said he even despaired of life itself? St. Paul was about to pull the plug on life. And he said, I can't. I'm done. I can't take it. You, you, you can relate to that, that frustration. Maybe not to that degree, but that frustration of, I, I have no control. My life is out of my control. I can't. I'm done. I can't. St. Paul said that one time. And look what he said after that. He said, blessed 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Did you catch that one? What he's saying is, is I've seen some hard times. 
But it's from those hard times that God comforted me. And my greatest ministry has been in comforting others in the same way that God has comforted me. Your greatest ministry and effect and influence in life will not flow from your strengths, but rather from your weaknesses. Who's the best person who could help someone quit smoking? Who's the best person who could help someone quit smoking? Someone who's quit smoking. Someone who smoked for years and couldn't quit, and then they quit. Out of that weakness came a strength. I cannot lead a quit smoking ministry. It would be worthless. I would just say, don't smoke. And that would not be very encouraging for anyone. Who's the best person to help someone who has lost a loved one to cope with that? Me? Who all my family's around? Who's the best person to help someone who's lost a loved one? Someone who's lost a loved one. Who's the best person to encourage and pick me up to single moms? Single moms! Maybe your greatest weakness, God wants to use it as your greatest influence and encouragement to other people. Do not, please, waste your pain. Do not waste your pain. You know the pain that you've gone through in life. And you know the rejection. And you know the hardships and the tribulations. Don't waste it. God wants to use it. Don't just throw it away. <clears throat> Today we're going to see how God wants to use my pain. And how I can begin to help others. How I can share, make the sharing choice. So that I would be blessed, God would be glorified, and others would be inspired. Four ways that you can make the most out of your pain. Number one is you share how pain got your attention. I shared how pain got my attention. When God gives pain, pain is never the problem. Pain is just the symptom. Pain or hurts or whatever it is, is exactly like the oil light in your car, the gas light, the gas light in your car. The little thing on the car that lights up with a little gas tank is not the problem. The problem is not the light bulb. Because if the problem is just the light bulb, you could just smash it with your hand and make the light bulb go off. The problem is not the light bulb. The problem is what the light bulb is indicating. And a lot of us is the same way. You got pain in your life. You got problems in your life. You got financial problems. You got relational problems. You got stress. You got problems. Man, the problem isn't the problem. The problem is what's underneath it that God is just trying to get your attention for. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 30. Can you relate to this verse? Blows that hurt cleanse away evil, as do stripes the inner depths of the heart. Can you agree with this? Everyone agree with this? That sometimes it takes blows that hurt. I love that verse. Blows that hurt to cleanse the inside. Like the little love taps that God likes to give us, Man, those, we don't change with those. We don't change when God says, it's now, it's a nice time to change. Now I'm trying to get your attention. Excuse me. Hello. And we don't change when God does that. Sometimes it takes blows that hurt. And sometimes you're really thick-headed. It takes several blows that hurt. But it's always done to cleanse the inside. I'm sure if I asked you to tell me a story of one time where you didn't get the nice and it took a I'm sure every single person in this room could share a story how many times do I sit in my office someone says I gotta see you Boone Anthony I need to talk I need to talk okay I need to talk married person tell me I, I just can't stand her anymore I don't understand her she's crazy okay relax calm down where are things at? Where's she at? Oh, she moved out and living with her mom. Where were you six months ago? Why are you waiting till she moved out to say there's a problem? Why? How do people come to me in their spiritual life? They'd say, you know, I made this mistake and this, and I made this, I made the worst mistake, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Did this just happen overnight? Did this happen overnight? 
It didn't happen overnight. Why do we wait till we hit the bottom to wake up? I don't know, but that's our nature. That's our nature. So what God does, because He loves us, is He makes it hurt. Because unfortunately, oftentimes, we don't change until the hurt is too much. There's an expression, I read in a, a quote and I read in a book, that God has to lay us flat on our back in order to get us to look up to Him. God has to lay us flat on our back in order to get us to look up to Him. Pain is God's wake-up call. Pain is God's way of saying, Hello? You there? Do you see me? You okay? You don't see me? Well, you're going to see me now. C.S. Lewis, I believe, is the one who said that God whispers to us in our pleasures and He shouts in our pains. Pain is God's megaphone to get your attention. You remember the story of the prodigal son? Everyone knows that story, right? Luke chapter 15. The prodigal son made lots of mistakes. Came back to his father. He repented. The Bible says he came to himself. He came to his senses. Realized his great mistake. What made him realize his mistake? What made him realize his mistake? Was, did he realize his mistake as he was sipping on his latte in a Starbucks? As he was raking in the money and checking out his bank statement and realized, oh, you know, I think I need to make a change right now. What made him, made him realize he made a mistake? Was when he was looking at the pigs and the pigs were laughing at him. And the pigs wouldn't share their snacks with him. That kind of pain is what it took for this boy to realize something that's so obvious to the rest of us. You need your father. You can't live without you. It's so obvious to us. He didn't realize it until the pain became so much. That's our human nature. It doesn't have to be that way. It's your choice. But God's going to get your attention one way or the other. Another story from the Bible. You guys know the story of Elijah. Elijah was a man of God. Strong man of God. God loved Elijah. And God was so close with Elijah and he spoke with him so intimately. Elijah and God were like that. And God took care of all of Elijah's needs. And it was one day where God saw Elijah needed a break. He took him over to a place, a brook of Cherith. The name of the area is called Cherith. Okay, or Kareth. He took him to this brook. And God said, hey, Elijah, you've been working overtime. I'm going to take you to this little resort. And I'm gonna, it's full service around here. It's all inclusive. I'm going to bring you, you don't have to get up to get food. The ravens are going to bring you food and bread. Every day. All inclusive. You don't got to pay. You don't just sit there. You just sit there by the brook, by the pool, and you just look up and the food's going to come. The water's going to be ice cold. No one's going to bother you. It's going to be great. You're going to love this resort. Elijah loved it. But he loved it too much. He loved it to the point that he started to get comfortable. So what happened when he got comfortable there? Well, here's the verse, the full service. First Kings 17, 5 and 6. So he went. God told Elijah to go to this brook. He's going to take care of him. So he went according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook of Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Perfect. He's, he's hooked up. He's just hanging out. Got no commitments. God led him to this place. God told him go. He went. He got too comfy. What's the next verse? Verse 7. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. What happened? The brook dried up. You ever had a brook dry up in your life? You ever had something suddenly disappear? All of a sudden, God leads you to a place, all of a sudden, He pulls the rug out from underneath you? You ever had that brook dry up in your life? A friend who was always there, who you rely on, and you can't live without this friend? All of a sudden, God removes them. Your health, your home, your pocket, your wallet, your 401Ks. You ever had God pull, God pull the rug out from underneath your feet? Elijah, like me and you, Elijah got mad. Why, God? Why do you do this? Why do you stop loving me? Why do you stop taking care of me? Where are you, God? God, you're the one who brought me to this book. Isn't that what it said right here? 
I did according to your word. You brought me to this brook. And now all of a sudden, you dried up the brook? What happened? What was God's answer? Elijah, I love you. And I brought you to the brook. But now it's time to move. And you have gotten too comfy. So the only way you're going to leave this brook is I remove the brook. Sorry. I was whispering to you saying, Elijah, now it's time to pack up. Now is last call here at the brook. Ravens are leaving now. It's, it's time to go. You didn't hear it. So what I had to do? I dried up the brook. Did it get your attention, Elijah? Oh, yeah, it got my attention. Elijah moved on his way because the brook dried up. Did you ever consider the fact when God removes the brook, pulls the rug out from underneath you, did you ever consider the fact that God doesn't want you to do today what you did yesterday? Did you ever think of that? Like you've gotten so comfy with whatever and you've gotten so much in your routine. Did you ever consider that God wants you to change? God wants you to grow. Like I don't like people, sometimes people come to me and say, you know, I can't do this. When I, you know, first came to God 10 years ago, my life was like this. I can't get that back. Why do you want to get that back? God doesn't want you to get that back. God wants you to go forward, not backward. This is like someone who's in, 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 in 10th grade saying, man, I remember in 2nd grade, I was in the best reading group. Man, I was, life was great. Now my grades were great. If I could just go back to 2nd grade, things would be okay. No, it wouldn't be okay. It wouldn't be okay. God wants you to learn this 10th grade stuff. And then after that, He's going to want you to learn 11th grade. God wants us to move forward, not backward. And sometimes God Himself will take you to a brook, and then He Himself, with His own hand, will remove the brook. There must be a reason why. That leads us to the second way that we can share to help others. As I share not just what God did, but what God taught me, what I've learned in the process. Again, God doesn't waste a hurt. And if God brought a hurt and brought a pain, there's a lesson inside it. The only way to learn this lesson, though, and to see what God like, wants to teach me is I have to be open, honest, authentic, genuine, whatever the word you want to use, sincere, whatever word. I have to be honest about what it is that God is doing in my life. I have to be honest about certain things. Number one, I need to be honest about my feelings. Okay? I need to be honest about my feelings and not convince myself that everything's okay just because I want it to be okay. I need to be honest and say, right now, I'm annoyed. I'm frustrated. St. Paul did in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. He said, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. He said, I'm not trying to pretend something I'm not. Okay? I got frustrations. I got stuff. I, I'm, I'm open. Okay? I, this is making me tired. I'm despairing even of life. Second thing, a little bit harder, our faults, our failures. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, St. Paul said, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. St. Paul is saying, I got no problem admitting, I got problems. Okay? And I make mistakes all the time. I got faults, I got failures. I'm honest about it. Third, share my frustrations. Kind of ties into the feelings, but another F word's nice. Romans 7.15, the verse that we all know and the verse that we all experience every single day and if you don't experience it, you're lying. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. For what I hate, that I do. Look, it isn't easy to admit this. This takes strength, this takes guts, this takes courage. But this is the way that you can find healing, to admit, look, I got stuff in my life, this is what I want to be, and this is who I really am. And that frustrates me. Trying to hide and say it's no big deal never works. And last one. Whoop. That should say my fears. I'm sorry. My fears. Okay? My fears is the last one on the back side. Be honest about my fears. No one wants to be honest about their fears, but there's value. Let's see the value. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5 and 6. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. 
Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. What happened here in this verse? St. Paul said, inside me were fears. And then a boy named Titus came along. And he helped me with my fears. How? By sharing. By sharing. God wants to recycle your pain and use it for good in others. But you must first be honest about your feelings, your faults, your failures, your frustrations, and your fears. You've got to admit the stuff that's going on inside. Now let's be honest. We're not good at this. We're not good at this. We don't like feelings. We don't like to share feelings. Especially us, Egyptian, for the most part. Okay, there's only one feeling that Egyptians like to share, and they will share it loudly and proclaim it to the top of their lungs. That's the feeling of hunger. Other than hunger, we have a tough time being honest about our feelings. But that's the only way to find healing. Why? Think about it this way. You know how they say that you learn a lot from your mistakes and you learn a lot from experiences and faults and things like that. It's very wise to learn from your experience. But you know what is wiser? In addition to learning from your own experience, to learn from the experience of others. Because here's the thing. I got a lot of mistakes in life but so do you. And you, especially with the number of people in this room, you got all kinds of mess up, okay, that I really would rather not get into myself. And I would be much quicker for me and much nicer for me just to kind of take your word for it and learn from your mistake without having to relive it myself. The body of Christ is better served when we lean on each other and you learn from my mistakes and I learned from your mistakes. So we're not reinventing the mistake wheel, so to speak. And we don't have to learn. We don't have to make the mistake ourselves and fall ourselves in order to gain from it. It's quicker and it's much better to learn from one another. This is why the Orthodox Church, why is it that we read the lives of saints? Why? To learn from their experience, both positive and negative. Why is it we study characters in the church history? To learn. Why is it that we have small groups? To learn from each other. You need to learn what God is doing in your mistakes as well as in the mistakes of others. That's why we need to share it. Third thing that I can share. Now we get to the good stuff. I share how God brings good out of bad. I want you to think really hard. You shouldn't have to think too hard. Can you think of a time where God brought good out of a bad thing in your life? Meaning, you defined it as bad, and God brought something great out of it? Every one of us has stories to tell about something that we prayed against, and we said no, 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 and the biggest disaster, and God brought it to bless my life. Everyone has a story like that. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, most well-known verse in the Bible, most least understood. Most least understood. Least understood verse. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. No matter what happens in life, no matter what pain may be, I may not see the good, but I know. See, this is faith. That's what faith is. I may not see, but I know. I may not see good, but I know. Regardless of what I see, and regardless of what everyone else around me tell me, I know that God brings good out of all things. Not that everything is good, but everything works together for good. And that even though it may be bad on its own, when you put it all together, it works for good. I want you to think of God, okay? You know the symphony? Okay? This guy. Okay? That's who God is. God is this guy. And God looks at the back and he does like this to some guy over there, then he evens him back out. 
Okay? This is God standing above the universe. Forget the universe. Standing above your life. And he has all the universe at his control. And God is orchestrating. Okay? Nothing's random. Nothing's random. We don't believe in random. We don't believe in chance. We believe in a creator who is in charge of the universe. And who is orchestrate. And God sees your life and he sees, let's say even someone does something bad. Okay? Someone hurts you. and Someone brings pain. As an orchestrator, maestro, God can see, hey, the tuba guy, he's gone up too high. So let me bring the violin guy. Can you come up to match him? Because this guy mistake, so I'm going to fix his mistake with you. I can do that. And now this guy in the back is way off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it short, okay, just to fix his mistake. That's how God is. That's how God is in your life. And every single second of the day, you don't realize it. That's what God is orchestrating for you. And he's bringing good out of bad, bringing blessing out of pain. You don't see that, but he's always doing that. Can God bring good out of sins? Can God bring good out of sin? Let's see, what, what does the verse say? Don't think. What does the verse say? And we know that... What's the most important verse in this, word in this verse? All. Can God bring good out of sins? Can God bring good when people try to sin against me? Can God bring good out of catastrophes and natural disasters? Can he? Yes. That's what the verse says. There isn't anything that God can't make together for good. Let me tell you a funny story that happened in my house a couple weeks ago to prove this point. It was a couple weeks ago. I woke up. It was a Monday morning. Okay, Monday's my day off. Okay, and somehow it had been like a busy whatever the week before, whatever. So I really needed this money. So I decided on this Monday, this is me Monday. Okay, this Monday's me. I hadn't watched the Skins game because I don't. I TV all the Skins games. Okay, back when the Skins were like useful and, and, and were relevant, okay? So I TiVo the games. So this particular Sunday, I didn't get home till like 11 at night, and, and I didn't have a chance, like I was exhausted, so I just went to sleep. I was going to wake up the next morning. I hadn't talked to anyone, didn't know that result of the game. I'm going to watch the Skins game in the morning. Good as new. And I decided I'm going to treat myself to a nice breakfast. So I decided I'm going to have me some pancakes. Chocolate, chocolate, chocolate chip pancakes. There was one problem in my plan. I don't know how to make pancakes. But I had in my mind a vision. There was my vision. I seen Marianne make pancakes. Doesn't seem like it's rocket science. I'm going to make me some pancakes. Marianne wasn't home at the time, and thankfully, when you hear the rest of the story. I got the little box with the stuff that I seen her use, okay? And it's for regular pancakes, and my thinking is the best part of pancakes is going to be the chocolatey part, so I'm just going to add in a bunch of stuff that I want. So I get out the box, and it's this thing. I get out the machine, and I plug it in to warm up or preheat or whatever it does. And I start reading these ingredients. Eh, X amount of pancake mix stuff. Eh, some uh, milk. Uh, butter, eggs, something called um, uh, starch. I don't know what starch is, okay? Some salt, some sugar, all kinds of crazy stuff, okay? And I was like, man, just give me the chocolate, okay? So I kind of skimped on some of the ingredients. I don't think we had milk. I added water. What's the difference? <laughs> I like eggs. I threw a couple extra eggs in there for good luck. I, to this day, don't know what starch is. I know the stuff in the laundry room. Don't think it should go in the pancakes. Skip that. I'm not a salty guy. No salt. Oil. 10,000 different kinds of oil in, in the thing. So I just pulled the one that was the darkest color. And I started to mix. And I'm mixing. And I'm mixing. And I'm watching the pregame show, and I'm mixing. Okay? And then it comes to my favorite part, which is not in the ingredients, which is the chocolate. So I get the bag of chocolate chips, and I... Like that. And I'm telling you, when I was mixing the batter, the batter was the color of my shirt here. Okay? That was the color of my batter. Woo! And I got me some pancakes. And I put them suckers in the pancake machine. 
And I was waiting and I was waiting and I pulled those things out. Scraped those things out, really. Okay. And I enjoyed the worst pancakes ever. Ever. I ate every last bite of it. This was the most painful experience of my life. Why? Because I didn't know what I'm doing. You ever seen Bruce Almighty? Okay, remember when Bruce Almighty was the role of God and he messed everything up? This was me with the pancake. What's a better way? Is when Marianne is home and you give her all these ingredients and she maestros them into some chocolatey chocolate chip pancakes. When the maestro is in the kitchen, things come out good. When I'm in the kitchen, different story. God, like my wife, maybe I should say my wife like God, okay? <laughs> Flip it around there. Can take the worst ingredients, things like starch, things like oil, salt, whatever, and can maestro them in a way that makes sweet pancakes. We want just more chocolate. Just God, just give me more chocolate. Just give me more good stuff. Just put more in. Leave out. Just give me more of this stuff. And God says, you want a good pancake or you don't want a good pancake? You want that or you want the mess that you made? Let me put my own ingredients in. When God makes the pancakes, it's delicious. I'll tell you another true story. But this one's serious. A story that happened to me just this past week. Like I told you guys in the beginning, this campaign isn't just for you, it's for me. And it's for me first and foremost, and I benefited so much from this campaign, I'm sad to see it go. I love the book, I love my small group, I loved all these lectures that I'm giving you guys, I benefited more from them than you can imagine. Anyone who says that they didn't benefit from this is someone who didn't put anything into it, because if you put into it, man, this stuff is something that we all need. I learned more about myself in these past few weeks than I think I had my whole life. And one of the things that God taught me was just this past week on Wednesday night, I was out of town. I was in Nashville, Tennessee, country music capital of the world. I was there for a conference, and somehow whenever I go out of town, God does, uh, God does some good stuff. Recently, my life has been very busy. It's always busy. It's been really busy to the point where I would say it's out of control out of my own control. And there's a lot of things that I keep on saying I want to do, and I just, I wish that I was just falling short right here. Like, I'm not even on the map with all the things that I want to be and want to do. Personal, spiritual, relational, everywhere I want to be, i would fallen so short in these past several weeks. So I made excuses. And I blamed the busyness, and I blamed this, and I blamed, and I blamed everyone else around me, including you. Blamed everyone else around me. I remember the idea that was in my head for so long. I had had this picture of me in a little raft, okay? A little raft, a little dinky one holding on for life. And not a tidal wave, but like three, a triangle of tidal waves. One in front, one over here, and one over here. And here's me on my little raft just waiting for all them tidal waves to fall. And see which one's going to kill me first. Just keep on paddling, paddling, paddling on my little tidal wave. Try to get, escape on my little boat. Try to escape these tidal waves. Well, Wednesday night in Nashville, Tennessee, in a little in room 104 of whatever rinky-dink motel I was in, they came down a crashing. And God revealed stuff to me through some bad experiences. God revealed something to me. Is that I... Like I'm practicing being honest here. Is that I chase after success. That's me. That's who I am. I want to be successful. I don't want to be rich. I don't care about money. I don't want to be famous. I don't even care if you think I'm successful. But I need to every single day go to my mirror and say mirror, mirror on the wall. I need to look at the guy in the mirror and say, you did a good job. You were successful. You set out on these goals. 
you succeed. I don't care if anyone else sees it. But I need to do that. I, I, success became my, my goal. How is God going to teach me that I'm chasing the wrong goal? Failure. And God kept bringing me failure after failure. And I blamed this person. And I blamed that person. And I failed more. And then I blamed that person. And I failed more. And then I blamed my schedule. As if that's some, like, some, like, boogeyman in my house. This is my schedule. And then I blamed the society. And then I blamed technology. And then I blamed Obama. And I blamed Bush and, and whatever. And God said, in the end, it's you. You, it's you. You're chasing success. You started off chasing me. Now you're chasing success. And God says, that can't work. So what you're going to do is you're going to fail. And you know, all those nice goals you set and what you're going to do spiritually and you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to fail. And you're going to be the worst person spiritually. You know what St. Paul says of sinners whom I am chief? God says, I'm going to make you say those words and believe it. Not just say it in a sermon so you look nice and look humble in front of other people. I'll make you see those words that you are a failure. And then all those things that you preach about how you should live your life, I'm going to make you fail in every single one of those. And I remember, I never write in my journal like, like a lot. Okay? My journal is concise, and brief, to the point. Okay, bullets, never sentences. I wrote sentences in my journal this day. Sentences, paragraphs, pages. I wrote three pages. And the common theme of all of them was, God, I'm a failure. God got my attention. But you know what? You know what? See, me being a failure, that's the worst thing to me. But you know what? That was the best day I've ever had in my life. That was the best night of prayer I ever had in my life. Anyone who says that God is not alive and God is not present when you pray, that person should have been in my hotel room in Nashville, Tennessee last Wednesday night. Because God was as real as you and me are real. And God was so real. What happened there? God brought me pain. He taught me a lesson. And then he brought good from that lesson. This is how God works. And then when I saw that this was the lesson for this week, <clears throat> God brings me pain. God gets my attention. He teaches me, you need me. And you're supposed to be chasing me. And you're trying to be successful just so you can be su You need me. Remember me? Me? God used that pain, that frustration, to bring about a lot of good in my life. And he wants to do the same in yours as well. But you got to let him. That's the key. you got to let... you got to get your hand out of the mixing bowl. And you have to say, I don't know how to make waffles. God, here, you make the waffles. you got to accept that you don't know how your life is supposed to go. And you've got to be honest about your problems, about your failures, about your frustration, about whatever, so that God can bring good out of those very same things. Here's what I want you to do right now, in your head. I want you to think of the biggest mistake you have ever made in your life. The biggest disappointment or failure, the greatest shame that you yourself, you know it, but you don't want to talk about it, and you don't want anyone else to see it, the greatest thing that you regret or whatever in your life. Everyone got something in their mind? Now here, hold that. Don't, don't let go of that thought. I want you to hold that thought, and I want you to realize this, that before you were born, God knew that. Before you were born, God knew that. And God says, I still love you. God says, I still love you. I still love you. I still have a plan for you. I knew that. That, I knew that. There's not a surprise. No, I knew that. And I still got a plan for your life. Because there's nothing that you can ever do, with all due respect, that's higher than my plan. You can never foil my plan. 
with all due respect. You can't. Psalm 103, verse 10 and 11. I love these verses. Anyone ever feels down, Psalm 103 is your, is your, is your song. Psalm 103 is the best song. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. When I read that verse, all I think to myself is, wow. Isn't that a wow verse? No matter what my stupidity, or what my idiocy, my failure, God says, I got a workaround for you. I got a workaround. You never paint me into a corner. You have the most miserable life. It's okay. I don't treat you according to your iniquities. God always has an escape plan for us. And God is always, remember, always. And no matter what mistake you may make, tuba player in the back row, third strings, violins, chorus, bass, treble, no matter what mistake you may make, He's always orchestrating. He's always got a way around it. And that leads us to our last point. As I share how Jesus gives me hope. Look, trust me on this one. Every single person that you meet today needs hope. Every single person that you meet or run into today is in need of hope. In different areas, but there isn't a person out there. I told you, I stand up here and look perfect. I was the most one in need of hope this past week. Everyone has a hidden hurt, a hidden pain. And when you share how God has given you hope, you have a captive audience. Trust me. You have a captive audience who is waiting on every word to show how you found hope, even in the midst of of your tough situations. So many these days, like I've never seen before, are on the verge of hopeless. I told you guys before, that's the worst thing. It's despair, hopeless, that's the worst. And so many people today are, are, are on the verge. Financial. So many people are on the verge of financially hopeless. Career, hopeless. Relational, desperate. Emotional, f family stuff. Spiritual. So many people are on the verge of hopeless. And maybe, just maybe, you, since you've been through it, are the answer that God is trying to send to them. Last verse here. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the ho ask you a reason for the hope that is in you. You know what God wants us to be? You want to make short-term change, long-term change? You want to find long-term freedom? Become a hope dispenser. You know, in the lobby now in the church, there's that hand sanitizer dispenser. Okay, it's one of the fancy kinds. You just stick your hand under and it squirts on you. No touch necessary. That thing's cool. God wants me to be the same. But not with hand sanitizing. With soul giving hope too. God wants me to be a hope dispenser. Where someone runs into me, they find some hope. Someone runs into me, they find honesty. Someone runs into me, and then I don't see someone who's trying to hide and pretend and whatever. There's someone who's honest, who knows his mistakes, who knows his failures, who admits them to God, admits them to himself, and is willing to help someone else get in that same position, or get out of that same position, I, su I should say. Who does God want you to share with this week? Are you ready? Are you ready to share? What I encourage you to do. I hope, like I said, this campaign has been something powerful in your life. But let's be honest. If all we did was come up with an eight-step formula of how to whatever, and then it's back to life as usual when we finish, wasted my time, your time, everyone's time. We need to make this short-term change and a long-term change. And what's going to do that is when you are willing to become a hope dispenser. When you are willing to continue to make these eight choices. And what I encourage everyone to do is hold on to your notes. Keep these eight choices always in front of you. 
Because there's going to be times in your life, like I said, pain is inevitable. You're going to have ups, you're going to have downs. Keep these choices in front of you. And keep on working through them. And what you're going to see is God's going to take you from 9th grade to 10th grade to 11th grade to 12th grade. And no matter what may happen along the way, never forget who's making the pancakes. Never forget who's in the front of that orchestra. Is our great orchestrator God who makes good out of everything. Let's stand up for a prayer, please. Thank you.